Welcome back to Muscle Minds with Dr. Scott Stevenson. I'm Scott McNally. This program is brought to you by TrueNutrition.com. Our code is ADVICES, and uh, if you use that code, you'll get a discount. I believe if you buy a bulk order, you get 10% off. Uh, Dr. Scott, what's up, man? How you been? Good, good. Um, we'll, we'll see if there's an interruption today. I am finally back inside at the regular computer. Um, we have called for an electrical inspection on my house. So okay. Uh, the contractor and the inspector might come by. He said he was set up for today, and I was expecting him hours ago, but he's a no-show, So, but that doesn't surprise me. Nice. So they'll probably come walking in at the absolutely most inopportune time, but um, they won't be here very long because they just got to check a couple things. So Right on. It'll be a little real life in the day of, day of Scott. Right so, on. So uh, first of all, I want to mention, um, I saw this all over social media, Swoley Trinity is going on tour and you guys are going to uh, Armbrust Pro Gym and this is going to be August 10th and 11th. You're doing a couple mm -hmm. of all day seminar type things. Two days, the whole weekend. Yeah. It's okay. going to be morning lectures with, with Alan and Alan Aragon, Paul Carter, <laughs> myself, and we're going to do morning lectures, afternoon gym stuff. Okay. So Alan's going to do like he's not going to be in the doing stuff in the gym, but he's going to be doing kind of hands-on nutrition-based stuff. And then Paul and I are going to be in the gym showing people shit. Okay. Um, yeah, mind muscle connection types of things and um, various sort of training techniques. So it's going to be not going to be like just snoozing away, science-based, cool sciencey shit in the morning. Your face yeah, is like half off, off the screen. Just to let you know. The other other way. Better. <laughs> now you're gone there we go there we go that's people i have a face for radio though so this is probably a good thing let me see here what i'm looking like sorry that's all right I'm trying to like let me switch you back here. where the hell is it scott's getting caught up in the technology now there we go all right ah all right cool all right there he is there he is with this fortitude training tank on um that'll be really cool man so it's coming up august 10th oh, and 11th be awesome and you yes, guys are going to have um, uh, you guys have a, a an early bird special right now, right? Mm -hmm. Or until Wednesday, um, four fifty. Okay. Um, and as opposed to six hundred, that's in Denver, Colorado. People don't know this is uh, this is Phil Heath's gym. Yeah. Um, Heather Grace trains there. Um, Brett Wilkin and Ivano Vusic train yeah. there. Um, Ken Hill I used to train there every once in a while. Yes, yes. Back in the day, before he moved from Colorado, Dorian um, Haywood, Adam Young. There's a bunch of badasses. There. Yeah, there's a bunch of badasses there. So yeah, um, it's a really like it's probably one of the top five gyms in the nation. I guess. Have you, you know? trained there before? I have not. I, that's I, one of the ones. Like, I haven't been there. I've been to um, I've been to Venice Golds, of course. I've been to the in the powerhouse down here, which they called the Mecca of the South. I've been to Bev's gym, trained there. Okay, how was Bev's? I was there at like like two in the morning or something like that. I liked it. Yeah, I think I told did I tell you a story about that Bev's. I can't remember now. Uh, I ran into a guy I used to train there actually this past weekend, and I told him, and he said that, he said he didn't think that was possible, the timing of because he thought the gym was not open at that time. But yeah, this was like four or five years ago. I was up seeing a friend and a dog, believe it or not, in Rhode Island. Okay. Last chance to see a dog who's on her way out. She's kind mm. of my dog for years. And I had my big 36-foot RV with a tow behind towed um, Pontiac vibe. Okay. And tire blew out on a um, on my way to where I would have been going to Gold's or to, to Bev's, Bev's uh, powerhouse. Mm -hmm. So I got held back that day. But I wanted to get out of that weather and get away from there. So... Um, I think I spent like, you know, five, six hours getting the tire fixed, blah, blah, blah. And by the time I got to where I was going to, to make this happen, I was like, just to get to the gym. Cause I would think I was meeting someone else, like somewhere down the coast or something. Yeah. I had to go in there and train like two in the morning. So I went in, I just, I trained at like two in the morning. I'm like I'm, I'm going, I'm like here. I, I found the RV park that I'm going to. Yeah. It's a horrible RV park. And I just went and made it happen. I got a, I got an awesome workout. There's like one person in the gym. Good guy. You know, some some shifty person, you know. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, <a> <laughs> he probably thought you were a shifty guy too. I was, I was, I was a shifty guy too. You know, so like two <laughs> shifty guys, and that was it. So I bought a couple t-shirts. Yeah, and uh, that was my my gym experience. I got it done. 
Nice man. So I do that a lot when I travel. Sometimes I just like get there and I'm exhausted. I'm like I got to tra- either I got to train. It's not going to happen tomorrow, so I just get it done. I'm still going. I feel you say that. Fumes, yeah, I've yeah. heard you say that before. You're like I just got off the plane and went straight to the gym. I've had to do that in the UK. Like I just do it. You know, yeah. just get it done, get it out of the way. Yeah. And then you, and then when you eat and crash, it just feels awesome. You feel great. So. Oh, I bet, man. I usually yeah. don't do that though. I usually get some rest. I eat a couple meals, and then I'm like, okay, now I'm ready to do it. Yeah, I don't know. I've just I got in that habit um, for some reason. I've trained yeah. a lot in the middle of the night and super strange hours. Many, many, many thousands of workouts over the years. Okay, so you're in grad school and stuff. Oh yeah, so. yeah, yeah. I could see that. Yeah. I had some twenty four hour gym memberships where I had to like. There was like one summer I trained every day at like three in the morning. Yeah, because we had to be. Uh, yeah, I had to be setting up at like five for. Uh, subjects to come in at six mm. so i would i got up at like 2 30 and trained to three or something like that it was the only chance to train so i either i, either I didn't train or i trained to three so i just trained to three yeah i so, could see that yeah. i could see that i'm i guess i'm a little bit more spoiled i haven't i haven't done any training like that um i'm i'm like a two o'clock one o'clock in the afternoon kind of guy Mm-hmm. Um, I, you know what I, while, before we, before we get into our questions, which we have some good questions later today, um, there was a topic I thought that you would really excel at. And I think it's subconsciously because I know you, I knew you already talked about it, um, in the back of my mind right. and that was, uh, improving weak body parts. I, I'd been thinking about this a lot lately. Um, I've been getting a few new nutrition clients and I don't do a ton of work with their training you know with what i charge i feel like it's just it would take too much time to get super involved with training but one thing i really like to do is assess somebody's physique look at the way they train and if i feel like there's somewhere that i could i could help them improve their training um say they have a weak body part then i'm thinking to myself like okay you know let's look at your leg training or let's look at your back training let's see what we can do to change that because it apparently isn't working as well as it was for as your training is for your other body parts right and it got me thinking i was like this is something i know i've talked about with scott before and i forgot you've made an entire youtube video which i'm going to link in the show notes so if you guys want to see that video you could check it out and then you mentioned too it's also in the new book be your own bodybuilding coach even more in even more detail there um but for maybe the next 15 minutes or so can we talk about uh, improving a weak body part and specifically I think legs are something that a lot of guys need to focus on, you know, I, and it, and it's looking at what's, what's the first thing we do. Cause my, my thought is, and tell me if I'm wrong here, Scott, I want to evaluate what's going on with somebody's legs because I've seen guys that have strong quads, but then no hamstrings. I've seen guys in, and that I've been in that situation. I've been in the same situation where then I've had strong hamstrings, but no glutes. Um, I've seen guys that have, not anymore. I'm, no, not, not anymore. Not weak anymore. And that, and it's taken some thinking, you know. Um, yeah. I've seen the situation, and I've been there too, where I've had a stronger outer sweep on my quads than I have, uh, you know, the like the the inner thigh and the adductor. So, what's the first thing that we would do? Would it be? Would it be? My thought is to analyze what we're looking at first of all, as far as your leg development goes. Well, let me let me take a step back. Usually, okay. it's, this is arms. The, I hear this question the most: guys want bigger arms. Okay, I get that all the time, like constantly. I'm, I can hear, I can hear Paul Carter's voice in the back of my head because he gets the same thing. People want they want bigger arms because arms are the showiest muscle. Mm-hmm. And the thing is, and this could be for legs, if someone is more advanced or any muscle group, but that's the one, arms are by 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 far the most common one. Is you're, if you're not growing everywhere, why would you expect a weak muscle group to grow? Mm, okay. So if you're not adding weight in some way, let's say you've been training for three or four years or even longer, and everything has grown fairly well except for this lagging muscle group or groups, and now you're thinking that you can somehow magically twist things around with your training or what ha- have you um, such that you don't have to have – an excess of calories coming in. You don't have to be growing overall and you can somehow propel forward the most stubborn muscle groups in your body. Yeah. Not going to happen. Just not going to happen. I mean, unless there's, unless you haven't been training them in some way, shape or form, chances are you have. So are you eating enough? Are you recovering enough? Are you training progressively? All those things 
have to be in place. And a lot of times that is, that's it. Like if you're 180 pounds and you, let's say you're, let's say you're 200 pounds, you started at 170, you gave 30 pounds and it's been mostly upper body. You have been training your legs in an even, evenly balanced, like push pull legs type fashion or something like that. You're not, you have been neglecting them. Okay. So, and they're just not growing. And so then you try for the next year to go to gain, gain some leg size and your weight goes from 200 to 200. It doesn't mm. change. Okay. Like you have to be, you, you may have to, let's say, let's say in general, like your leg size increased, uh, increases half as much as the other muscles do. Mm. That's probably a good indicator that, um, that's what may happen. All other things being equal in the future. You're trying to shift that ratio. You're trying to you're trying to like make the gains happen in those weaker muscle groups. Dante, which we maybe we'll cover later, of DC training. One of the things he used to say is that all in all, you can bring up weak muscle groups, but you will end up being a sort of a larger version of yourself. Mm, yeah, and in, in, in somewhat close to the same proportions. And there's a good deal of truth to that. You can bring up weak muscle groups, but um, you're not going to take someone who is just like has a Tom Platt's relative sym- symmetrical balance yeah. and turn them into um, Flex Wheeler. Right. It's not going to happen. Um, so all in all, you need to make sure everything is moving forward and so that you're, you've got the, especially the caloric excess and enough recovery in place, all the basics of your training. So that's, that's the first and foremost. And a lot of times that's, that's the thing is that you've got you've got people who are not wanting to put on body fat. They're not willing to make. They're not willing to push the gains in general, um, first and foremost, before they're gonna, um, in order to put on size in the weaker muscle group. And you may have to just like kind of, set, you may have to sacrifice more in terms of um, conditioning or body fat in order to get the size hmm. to happen in those weak muscle groups than you ever did before. Okay. If your if your arms and chest or your back or whatever was to grew, grew easily and you didn't have to really gain a whole lot of body it just grew naturally, that's great. You may have to you may have to really like push the weight up substantially hmm. in order to get those weak muscle groups to budge. Yeah. That makes sense um, then. There's a reason why they don't grow. And, you know, some of the things we'll obviously we'll get to here, but um some of those things you may not ever be able to overcome um, necessarily, um, and it could be it could be things like the relative density of satellite cells that are in those muscles. Mm. I, I have the sense I've, I've had this for a while that there's something that happens developmentally, epigenetically, or in terms of satellite cells based on your activity when you're younger. Hmm. Okay. Um, and I've talked about a friend of mine who was an amazing bench presser, but she she couldn't she didn't have strength in any other lift because she started like that because she started bench pressing when she was six. Okay. And so she was a great she was a phenomenal bench presser yeah. and um, like world class like she could have set world records in the raw bench press hmm. without even training for it, but everything else was pretty normal strength wise. Okay. But she bench pressed every day starting at the age of six hmm. until she was like eighteen. So yeah, it would so, stand to yeah to be that she would be strong on that exercise. So she yeah she was great on the exercise, and you could see it in her musculature too. Mm. But so something probably there was probably some interaction between what she was doing and what was brought, um, what was activated genetically and epigenetically, mm. um, according to what her genes would allow. That just couldn't happen. Yeah, you know thereafter like so much of what what makes us the adults we are today and you know this psychologically is a function of what you've been exposed to as a child as a kid and yeah. obviously like your family of origin is huge psychological effect um anyway that can go on that's a whole whole other topic but what you can do now as an adult is the work talk about today so so um making muscle grow we're thinking about basic stuff like loading it so progressive overload metabolic stress, muscle damage, um, cell swelling may have an effect, and then stretching, or at least having a full range of motion potentially. And there's a little bit of research suggesting that can be somewhat helpful, but that's even a mixed body of literature hmm. too. So first and foremost, um, is someone progressively overloading the muscle and is the muscle receiving the load um, during the exercise, and that has that's a function of mind-muscle connection, 
hmm. and and doing the exercises that you that are chosen for you. Yeah. Metabolic stress. Are you feeling the muscle? So if you like, a lot of people will find that muscles that are their strong muscles. Um, I think you've talked about this. Like you probably, if you go and train your calves, you probably get this just ridiculously unbearable pump in your sure, calves. Sure, sure. It's like fucking like, and you're like you're complaining about it. Like, oh my god, this hurts so fucking bad. Yeah. And, and right, is that true? I mean, is it? Yeah. Just, but then I can't yeah. get it in in a weaker body part, or it takes a lot of work, right? Uh, okay, yeah. So there's something something going on there. Something about like metabolic stress, and that's a whole other body of literature we've gone into a little bit. It's interesting, very interesting developmental. It's interesting because a lot of people are saying that there's some literature suggesting that metabolic stress per se, the way I'm looking at it is that there has to be loading during the metabolic stress hmm. um, in order to make it into a stimulus for muscle growth. But the fact that you get so much metabolic stress, you get such a pump, you get such so much cell swelling probably has is connected with the fact that those your calves are just ridiculously big okay yeah so those muscles that you can't get a pump in are also the ones that don't grow very well mm. why can't you get a pump there well they're not loaded appropriately or you can't connect with them during the exercises that you've chosen to do yeah so you're missing the mind muscle connection there um and then stretch is something that i something that i've included in my um in the fortitude training that's uh fortitude training program is choosing some sort of a post training stretch mm. that will have a metabolic stress under loading um like an extreme stretch from dc training what i call an inclusion stretch and there's just a flexibility stretch which is just um not not meant to be particularly stressful i just think maintaining flexibility makes sense um just uh it just makes common sense basically in terms of limiting injury potential yeah. um especially if you're want to do loaded exercises during full range of motion but there's something about an active contraction and you can produce muscle growth with isometrics hmm. that um can it could be a novel stimulus for someone who doesn't do that a lot of people who've come and done fortitude training at the camps i put on they've just skipped the stretches really <laughs> they just don't do them yeah it's the one thing like We'll train like legs, you know, and I'll run them through muscle rounds or the loading sets or whatever we do. And then I say, okay, now let's do the stretcher. Like, oh, yeah, I read about that in the book. <laughs> and I'm like, I'm like, we haven't been doing those. Like, no. I was like, well, let me show you this quad stretcher. They're like, holy fucking shit. Yeah. It blows them away how much that hurts. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah. So there's something to say there in terms of creating a stress that may be novel or new. Hmm. And this gets back to what basically the global theme that I'm getting at here with bringing up this weak muscle group is that you, if you keep doing what you've been doing, you'll keep getting what you've been getting, as Ronnie used to say. Yeah. You got to do something different. You have to create a novelty of stimulus if you want to create um, new growth. Yeah. That makes total sense. And yeah, yeah. I mean, it, it, that's you know, that's that's sort of a extension of general adaptation syndrome, Hanselia's general adaptation syndrome. Is that you need to you need to produce some sort of novel stimulus if you want to produce a novel adaptation. In this case, novel meaning growth where it wasn't happening before. Yeah. Supporting that with recovery and nutrients, food, caloric excess. Um, so that stretch under load is something that like Prillo used to do these, and, and Dante always gave credit to Prillo. He used to have people do stretches between exercises. Mm -hmm. Um, or between sets for an exercise, and I have people do it um, afterwards for an extended period, 60, 90 seconds. Okay. So that's something that can be added as just like that's just sort of that sort of take home number one. Hmm. Start stretching. One, it creates a stimulus. Two, especially if you do like a quad stretch where you like pull your heel back to your butt or mm -hmm. put your foot on like I usually use like a lat pull down pad or put my foot on the pad of a, like a, uh, a knee extension machine or something at about hip height. Okay. And then, and then pull your, your hip into extension and your knees are obviously in, in deep flexion. So you're stretching both the rectus femoris, the iliopsoas a little bit and the quad mm. and then contract during that as you try to deepen the stretch somewhat. Yeah. After you've just trained, those are absolutely brutal. You will feel pain and connection in the muscle in a way that probably most people have, if they haven't done that kind of stretch before have never felt mm. their life 
then you'll know what it's like to connect with a muscle while you're training and while you're contracting it. I think this deepens that that neuromuscular connection hmm. for many people because you, you're learning how to co- contract a muscle while it's under under pain like that, which a lot of times that's, that's the last thing you want to do. Hmm. Yeah. When people are pushing their sets towards that failure point, they'll take a break. Okay. They'll stop for a split second. That releases the tension in the muscle, allows the blood flow to carry carry out waste products that are that are activating those pain fibers, mm. the nociceptor pyrus. That's that's why you do that because it relieves the pain yeah. and and allows a little recovery so you can get a few more reps. Yeah, I remember I remember that. doing a set the first time I tried to do like a muscle round and I wasn't doing the consistent just consistent fluid reps. I'd do a rep and then I'd stop and do a rep and then I'd stop. And you had said, no, that's, you explained to me, it's like just walking straight off a cliff without hesitation. Yeah. And it's hard to do that. It's taken time, but I get what you mean though, that it's, it, then it's a constant tension is what you're saying. Yeah. There's a reason for doing that and avoiding those, those extended sets like that to save the nervous system taxation. Okay. That's the reason why I have continuous sets. And that's another, that's, we'll get to that with the DC training question that we'll get to later if we have time okay um but yeah that's exactly what i'm talking about is that people are trying to avoid that um because you want to you want to like turn those muscles off when they start to hurt that's exactly what you're looking for you called it self-preservation to me it, uh, yeah I'm, yeah i see the pups <laughs> are in the background yeah, yeah it is it's a ma- exactly it's a, it's a matter of like you're trying to avoid the pain and suffering there and it's the subconscious thing but really that's what you want yeah yeah yeah, it's it's, it's like, hard, man, because it it hurts so fucking bad. You know mm-hmm. that's that, that's your first inclination is to give it a give it a rest. You know that's what you want, though. That's exactly what you want. You want you're trying to hurt yourself. Yeah, right, right. In a non injurious way. Right. <laughs> yeah. Right. So that's the whole thing. So this stretch, especially the the extreme stretches when you're holding a load, um, and of course that requires a contraction to hold the load. And the occlusion stretch in fortitude training is you're just pressing against you know, a bar or a wall or an immovable object, and you're contracting as hard as you possibly can while you're in a deep stretch. Hmm. Not trying to go with max range of motion, per se, although you want a deep one. Just the stretch and the contraction of itself creates that occlusion. So you're getting, you're basically practicing contracting under extreme pain. Yeah. And you're also getting probably an angle-specific range of motion training effect there, too. So if you have people train knee extensions at 30 degrees of knee flexion versus 90 degrees of knee flexion, they'll get better at the 30-degree training um, if they train at that angle than if they do at 90 degree. Hmm. There's an angle specificity of, of training effect there. I can see so that. it's probably if like you're doing your like pec stretches like this and you're contracting under pain, Mm-hmm. You're and you're doing an isometric. You're going to develop some isometric strength in that range of motion with your hands there. Sure. I, I ha- this has not been documented because the endpoint would be a literally injury, probably. Okay. You could measure. You could measure um, isokinetic strength through a full range of motion and see if there's like an increase in strength at that angle. But probably training or doing an, uh, an occlusion stretch, as I've kind of termed it, where you're pushing as hard as you can. Produ- probably produces an angle specific increase in strength and ability to contract there and it's probably stability in the joint blah 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 in a way that is a good thing in terms of preventing an injury it can't be bad to a practice producing force in this in this part of the range of motion where you're in that deep stretch and probably uh, at greater risk of injury so there's something to say for that so that so that's one thing that people can add Looking for a novelty. Um, I'm kind of. I'm just going through this PowerPoint that I put together. So can I can I throw something in here? Because I feel yeah, like please. here's here's something I I've thought of is that I think about you know we'll, we'll take a guy who say was trying to bring his legs up. Um, I think a lot of times even like a guy who's been training for five years. You know, the first thought is to just 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 do like you said. You know, just do this consistent push pull legs. You're you're training everything consistently the same, and then you find that you have a weakness. I think the first thing my thought was to figure out what that weakness was. Would you, and I don't know if this will throw you off from the, 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 the almost like the lecture you had um, put together previously, but 
you know, I mean, weak legs, there's going to be a part of your leg that is weak, right? And I, I guess mm -hmm. my thought is, is it's to me, a big part of it to begin with is understanding the anatomy of what, what muscles are weak. Because if, if I'm moving weight, I'm moving the weight with something, you know, mm -hmm. and that I found that for me, that, that like I had said before, like, you know, maybe at one point I had stronger quad sweep, but then the adductors looked weaker, or maybe my quads were stronger, but then the hamstrings were weaker. And it's almost for me, it was like figuring out how to make those legs improve. It was figuring out what was doing the work to begin with, because you know, weak hamstrings were a sign that maybe I was doing more work with my hips or with the quads, uh, it, you know, versus versus putting the load into the hamstrings. Is this is this anything? Does this make sense to you where I'm going with this? Yeah, you bring up a, a, another very important point it relates to when I started with the arms thing mm -hmm. is that and this is one that Dante used to say, too, is um and it applies especially to legs. First of all, get some big fucking legs. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Right. Like if you're uh, if you're let's say you're five eight or five ten and you're 170 pounds soaking wet with a bag of bag of nickels in your pocket, as he used to say, sometimes too. And all these Dantes are coming up, popping in my head, but they all make sense. Then you just need size first and foremost. Yeah. So don't worry about nitpicking. Um, and those, you know, those, those smaller things, then what you're talking about is exercise selection. We we're getting there, but we can, okay. we can just move right ahead in figuring out what exercises or what variations on those exercises target the musculature that you're trying to train in the leg here with the, with the, in the thigh. Okay. So hamstrings, knee extensors, or the, or sorry, the, the knee extensors, the hamstrings, knee flexors, hip extenders, extensors. So. And you can figure that out by obviously looking at the biomechanics or Paul's favorite topic, look at the EMG, which I would do. That would be my last choice. Or where you feel it during the exercise. Mm. What do you feel? And that's probably, you know, I would probably put that at the top of my hierarchy, to be perfectly honest. What, what do you feel? What do you feel? I'll tell you why in just a second. Okay. Um, or where you get sore, and that's up there as well. Hmm. So... You can look at someone's, the biomechanics, and, and see what this is what this is supposed to do. This is where the muscles, which muscles should be the prime movers, which are secondary. You can look at an EMG study that shows you maybe what the average person tends to produce in terms of EMG activity relative to an isometric max or however, however they relativized it. But all that, none of that friggin' matters if the way you do things you don't feel it in the muscles that you want to feel it in, mm. and you don't get sore in the muscles that you that you want to be be training and doing those exercises. Yeah. So if you do squats, and I'll, I'll, this is my example for me, I did you, you used to do barbell squats in the way that I I feel like I could really do them, and I did them for well over a decade, and I got really strong at them. And it was a great glute builder. I had a gigantic glutes, but I did not get the leg size that I wanted. Exactly. That, yeah, that's what I'm thinking too. That's what I've seen in my own life, that kind of stuff. It, it was not a good choice for me. Yeah. And yeah. I mean, I would feel it in my legs to a certain degree, but I would feel it in my glutes. And I, I saw what grew and I saw what was sore. Um, and so that exercise was a, a poor choice for me. Hmm. That's that's basically the goes back to being your own bodybuilding coach, be your own Buddha, trusting your own self, listening to your own body, hmm. literally, as opposed to relegating your decision-making process to what someone else tells you right? Um, or what some study tells you the average person might find because there always are outliers, averages, and this goes back to the topic of biological individuality, are, are, there's a huge spread among people, among humans, in basically every physiological and biological variable that you'd measure, hmm. we're all very, very similar. We, you know, we have the same enzymes and of glycolysis and same some of the same basic processes. But if you look at at how those things all fit together, it's all over the place. Hmm. Yeah, and that's you know that's one of the topics I'll talk about. Like, just look at people's body fats. Go to the mall. Look at body fat. Look at how well people grow in the gym. Everyone's turning on protein synthesis. 
Not everyone. Some people don't turn on protein synthesis for shit hmm. after an exercise session. You can look at the data. There are some individuals that don't, that there's like zero a zilch as far as a blip. Huh, really? And increased protein synthesis. So yeah, the data are there. Like Stu Phillips has got a number, number of studies where they've, they plot the individual data points. Hmm. Just like people don't grow. Yeah. There's non-responders. They're people that don't get increase cardiovascular VO2 max. They don't increase cardiovascular fitness. Hmm. Doesn't happen. Then there are friggin' monsters. There's you know Lance Armstrong types of people, and Big Rami type of people. Yeah. That grow like friggin' weeds. So there's no reason then to think. And you look. You can look at the data if you if you could have access to it. You're going to see the same things in terms of relative activation of quads versus hamstrings hmm. on a given exercise. Um, you see it even like uh, things like glycemic index when you compare like maltodextrin versus white bread. Hmm. Some people have a higher GI for one versus the other. Some people are flip-flopped. Those things are all over the place. There's so much variability there. So you have to listen to what your body is telling you and to think the best way for exercise is where you're feeling it, which is up to you to a cer certain degree. Yeah. So first thing would be choose the right exercises. Um, and if you need to, this is what my Instagram channel is about to a certain degree, then get, get funky with it, which is another Danteism. Find an exercise and do it in a way that works for you. If you want more hamstrings, or obviously things like use a wider stance, externally rotate. That'll get your glutes involved a little bit more too. Um, put your feet higher on a leg press. Um, various ways to change your stance. Um, put the bar lower on a squat. Not so much a high bar. Change the depth in a way that works for you. So a lot of times going deeper will hit more glutes, hmm. hamstrings too. Yeah. Um, you'll have to go lighter as well. So those things. And then there also is, of course, the mind-muscle connection, hmm. which you can definitely change. Um, and there are ways to do that too. And that's like one of the next kind of big topics. But did that cover your it your does. idea there? Yeah. 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 So yeah, pick that, the right exercises and then and then vary them for you. Okay. Yeah, because I think yeah. that's a, that in itself. I feel like any any of these things could really be beneficial for somebody who is you know stopping and looking. Okay, I've been doing this for five years, and what am what am I seeing as results? You know, it's like it, right. it, is everything growing uniformly, and if not, what what can I alter to make this look better? Because mm -hmm. you know, we we talked about it on the phone briefly yesterday, just to kind of brainstorm on this. And it's like you said, this is bodybuilding. It's not it's not just the growth of the muscle, but it's the sculpting and the shape we're trying to create, right? Yeah, the the symmetry and the physique that you're trying to create. You're just not like if you have like you know, let's say you're just kind of built like a mountain gorilla with small legs and huge arms, upper body. Yeah, that's probably what you want. What you want for a bodybuilding stage. Yeah, you know, you you want you want to be able to you know equalize those things in a way that creates the prettiest physique possible. Absolutely, but you have to be growing overall. So first, grow overall, then make sure your exercises are chosen correctly, and then vary correctly, and then perform correctly neurologically. Yeah, which is the mind muscle connection, and that can take a swallowing your ego type of thing. So, yeah. progressive food, progressive overload, exercise selection, exercise modification exercise execution and that then that kind of leads us to the idea of a, the mind muscle connection mm. um so gosh a lot of things to be had there one visualizing mm. seeing this yeah. um initiating the a lot of people like even with beginners you can just tell them like on a, a lot of the studies have been done with like a bench press um they'll so they use your triceps more or use your pecs more mm. okay. and people can do that yeah um, they can they can make that make that happen. One of the things that seems to make sense, at least from one particular study with glutes, is if you try to initiate the movement, um, then this is all about having an internal attentional focus, where you're where you're basically and there's a conundrum here, where your your attention is internal on the muscle itself. So you're visualizing, you're thinking about it, you're feeling it. Yeah. As opposed to an external attentional focus. <laughs> Wow, came out of nowhere. <clears throat> An external attentional focus, like a power lifter has. Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> as long as the bar goes from from point A to point B, that's all that matters. Right. And their, you know, their their knees get to the right angle, or their hips row to the knees, all those sorts of things. But they're just trying to move the weight. Or for us, we're trying to stimulate the muscle 
and they're completely opposite. The conundrum, the paradox, the oxymoron here is that you're trying, you have uh, an external load that is going to be moved while all your focus is on what's happening internally. Hmm. Okay. And we tend as bodybuilders to want to monitor what's being produced internally as the stimulus by recording in a logbook and watching externally what happens with the weight in terms of the load and the reps, the yeah. number of sets and the volume. So all those things are those are external to the body. That's a work that's a performance phenomenon. Yeah. We're trying to create the stimulus to make the muscle grow. We're not trying to move the, the weight. The weight, in the truest sense of the word, really, the weight and the reps and the load and the frequency, all those things are, are secondary to what we're really trying to do, which is create the stimulus, um, physiological stimulus that produces the muscle growth. Mm. So you would want to move the load through the range of, a range of motion to complete a full repetition if that makes sense. Yeah. But, but like, for instance, here's a great example. Break this down because I'm now I was getting a little esoteric there. You'll see sometimes like, um, like really strong incline pressures or even bench press. Let's just take an incline where you see it most often. Like um, Chris Cormier comes to mind. I think he used to do this. He would not go all the way down to his chest. Mm. A lot of guys would not lock out. So in a lockout, it tends to be a lot of triceps. Most powerlifters will agree there. Mm -hmm. Well, bodybuilders, they don't, they're not trying to like perform complete reps because it doesn't fucking matter. Right. They're trying to use the exercise to train the chest. Right. It, and so you, you pick the range of motion, which feels like it can best activate the chest. And in this case, with a big heavy weight for a lot of those guys going really, really deep, didn't make sense. Right. So they didn't do that. And going to the end just meant fatiguing the triceps, creating a weak link to the exercise so the triceps would fatigue before the chest. And then your set would be in a pre, pre, uh, prematurely. Mm, yeah. Not what you want. You want the weak link to be the target muscle, which in this case, pectoralis major. Yeah. Maybe the pec minor. So you pick a range of motion that makes that exercise one to target the muscle. Mm, yeah. So that's someone who's got a smart, well attuned, probably kind of unconscious, intuitive, internal attentional focus on training the pecs. And they're not worried about someone saying on Instagram, bruh, 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 what's up with your partial reps? Like, do a full rep. Like, yeah. what's up with that? Full rep doesn't matter. Like, no one's, there's, there's no one who's going to say, you know, best chest on stage, but he never did full reps on his incline, so we're right. not going to pay attention to his chest. It doesn't matter. You're trying to, you're using the load and the exercise um, simply as an as a tool, so you want it to be internally focused. Yeah, there. So initiating with the target muscle seems to help with that. Going too heavy in the studies is like something above like eighty percent of a one rep max, which would be, um, you know, for a lot of those chest presses, like an eight rep max, something like that. Mm. So if you're going, if your reps are getting below like maybe six or eight. Um, then you're, you've gone above where most people can maintain a mind muscle connection hmm. in those in those studies, and those are using EMGs, so they, they do have the EMG does have some value. So, and the thing is, here's the, here's the deal: if you're at like if you're at 100 percent of a one rep max, you're using all the muscle available. Yeah, it's not it's a one rep max max. It's triceps and chest and anterior delts for sure. bench press. Let's say. So you can't have any mind muscle connection. If you did, you wouldn't be your. You'd have to lower the load because you, because you'd be you'd be disengaging some of those other muscles. Right. To make it a preferential pec exercise, it's no longer a wonder at max. So once you get to that heavier load, in order just to move it, you have to use everything. Hmm, yeah. You can't preferentially train. So if you're triceps dominant or you're a delt presser, as a lot of people are. And you've gone too heavy. You can't make that into a chest exercise when you're doing those presses. That makes sense. Yeah. 
Yeah, so if, like, let's say you're trying to bring your quads up on a squat or what have you, and you just tend to be someone who just drives with the posterior chain, mm -hmm. and you use your glutes and your low back, and you're getting to where you're, you know, you're doing, and this is what I probably did for many years, I did these heavy-ass squats, and because I went so damn heavy, I had to use, in order to even move the, those weights, I had to use the muscles that... I naturally engaged in order to lift the heavy weights. Yeah, yeah. I couldn't engage. I couldn't have a mind muscle connect. I literally, it was like mathematically, physiologically impossible for me to have a mind muscle connection and still do those types of reps. Yeah. Um, with that heavy load, and make it into a quad exercise, which is what I would have preferred. Yeah, that makes so, sense. I could I could think of it in my own training for sure. Yeah. So you go too heavy if you try to go too fast. Hmm. That also happens when have people try to do ballistic movements. It doesn't work. Um, because fast means all that effort. Hmm, you yeah. run into the same issue. You're going to use everything you can. Move the bar as fast as you can. Well, you're going to use as much muscle as you can. Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, if you were a highly trained person who's got a good mind-muscle connection, and you said, okay, I want you to lift this weight um, only using your pecs. I want your best mind-muscle connection. We're going to get your one rep max. Maintain that best, best mind-muscle connection. You're a highly disciplined, um, you know, Jedi of the weight room, and you can do that. Well, you're you're especially like with the like for me when I'm training chest in that way, mm -hmm. the loads that I can use go way the fuck down. Yeah, way the hell down because I'm a I'm a pretty decent overhead presser and I'm. I'm like I can overhead press behind the neck press, not with my shoulder the way it is, but it's getting better now. Um, just about what I can incline press, hmm. um, and which is just about what I can bench press. Like I'm just about as strong overhead as I am with like a flat or a nearly flat. I usually don't do flat presses very often, but and that's just because my chest is relatively so weak hmm. compared to my delts. So if I like use a true mind muscle connection and make my chest the target muscle and the weak link on pressing movements, then I'm a lot weaker. I bet, yeah. Yeah. So you can look at that and just take the comment. So let's say let's say you're you're let's say you're just someone who has just these oversized hamstrings and glutes and you're wanting to and you're doing compound leg presses and squatting movements to try to train in particular you want to bring your quads up. <clears throat> you want to make quads the the most focused muscle for those exercises. So you might want to just ditch some of those exercises. Stop doing squats. If you can't find a comfortable way to do squats and that hits your quads in a way that you feel and that makes them sore, adjust your foot placement. Hmm. Maybe, maybe do them more like Platts did. Hmm. That works for you. Um, or if, like if you're doing a leg press, um, like I have people do like a low, close leg press. So they bring their feet in like really, really close mm -hmm. and low on the foot plate. That tends to hit the quads really, really well. Um, just biomechanically, it forces forces that to happen. Um, and then let's say let's say you let's say you haven't done those. It's just like so you've got like a neutral stance. If in your neutral stance you know that you're driving with those strong, sort of predominantly neurologically wired muscles, the posterior chain muscles, and that's how you're able to lift the heavy loads you lifted. Now you want to engage a mind muscle connection and make it a quad dominant exercise. Your quads are just shit compared to your hamstrings and glutes. Well, guess what? The weight's going to have to go down if you're going to have the mind-muscle connection. Yeah, That's just the math of it. Now you're trying to rely more upon the, the smaller muscle mass, and you're basically disengaging, which can happen too. The, the, the research shows that people can disengage. like they People have been able to disengage the traps while doing side lateral movements that are supposed to hit the deltoids. They can... They can, they can even newbies can make that happen. Mm. So you can like literally use a focus on the muscle you're trying to hit, yeah, the weak one, while you intentionally disengage the others. So you're doing those leg presses, let's say with the neutral position because you, you've chosen that and you like it, you want to stick with that. And let's say normally you're using whatever six plates on a side on a leg press, and now you want to make it into a, you want to say, okay, I need to hit my quads because my quads never get sore doing this exercise either. I'm going to give it up. I don't want to. But I have limited equipment, various reasons. I'm still going to do these leg presses. You're not going to be able to use six plates anymore. Yeah. If you're, if you're tr being true to the mind muscle connection, at least at least not for a while until you relearn it. Is is there anything else that you really want to make sure we cover on this before we move on? Because we've been uh, we've been live for about almost an hour now. 
Um, and I want to try to keep this to a little bit shorter so oh, we can still get to some we questions. Can, we can stop whenever you want, my man. I've got, I okay. can talk for another hour. This is, I a, figured this is a, this is a pillar of extra of bodybuilding. Yeah. In yeah. my mind. You know what this too? Is, this is about as important as it gets. I wanted to this aspect of bodybuilding training. I wanted to share with you too. Um, so after my last contest, which was at the end of 2017, beginning of 2018, you and Jordan and I looked at my physique and we all determined I had better thickness than I did back width. And something something about my lats wasn't activating. And, and you had brainstormed with me on some things I could do. It's been, you know, a year plus since then. I could tell you that, oh, Scott, it, it's almost been like physical therapy for me. I had to start mm-hmm. out light. I had to find things that would that would help to to really activate that lat and that that outer, you know, the outer back really because it was really all everything I felt was kind of like in the rhomboids and in through the center of the back and that just kept coming out further and further but the width wasn't getting wider. I can say that at this point it's finally worked. I can I can get in the gym and I can do I can start with pull downs whereas before pull downs didn't feel as strong. I could do just pull downs and my lats are going to be sore from that. Like the outer through, through the armpit down. That's all, all of that outer. Like I could feel it now. I could feel it contracting. I could feel the blood in that outer back. And it's something that I hadn't felt in the past. It's taken me a long time though, to, to train myself to get that man. Over a year. Yeah. 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 It was over a year. Yeah. I've got a bunch more things I could go through. Um, I'll just try to, yeah. I don't want to keep. I don't want to bore anybody here. Um, I, don't, I don't think you're boring us, but could could we possibly come back to this on the next one then? Sure. All right. Uh, yeah. Cool. If you like? Let's uh, let's take a quick commercial break for the the radio you show. You just got to pee, is what it is. You, just, <laughs> you need to go urinate. Is I think the issue here. That's okay. <laughs> we'll take a quick we break for the bladder. radio show, people, and uh, we'll be back. Also, I wanted to say, Gerardo, uh, happy birthday to you. He's one of our listeners, and he just. Uh, posted saying hey guys so it was his birthday and he had given me some suggestions on the lighting so uh i appreciate it very much man hope you're having a great birthday and thanks for watching us guys we'll be back in just a second all right and for our video listeners i've got the be your own bodybuilding coach i just i wanted to give you a quick plug you got it too over there scott oh oh my gosh i know the guy who wrote that book actually He's an asshole. <laughs> I mean, look at him. Like, look at the, the like. He's like, you can just tell the guy is just an egomaniac. He's got his picture on his own book. Just, I, I know, right? <laughs> All right, guys, welcome back to Muscle Minds. Scott McNally here with Doctor Scott Stevenson. Uh, we are going to go to the questions. We are at um, the forum, which is uh, forum dot radio dot com. And uh, we are in the bodybuilding section. There are threads stickied for all the shows. Of course, this is the Muscle Mind uh, thread. And we have a question here from the Iron Duke, as he calls himself. I've heard of um, Christian Duke calling himself the Iron Duke. I don't, I don't, think that, I don't know if that's Christian him. Duke? I don't know. Uh, I don't know. Yeah. He says, um, hi, fellas. I have a question for both of you. Um, how would you recommend I maintain muscle over a layoff period of four to eight weeks? I will be having gyno surgery over the next, uh, few weeks. Oh, uh, over the next few weeks, uh, should I attempt to maintain, uh, my off season weight and risk change in composition, or should I just eat more or less than a normal person and allow my body to pull nutrients from fat slash muscle as it requires. I am uh, at the height of my off, oh, excuse me. I am at the height of my off season. So I would assume uh, the excess fat will be the preferred fuel source. I've never had a training break longer than a week or so. Um, I am not sure what to expect. Looking forward to your input. Thanks guys. All right, Scott, you ever take a long break? I just rambled. Okay, just rambled, man. Man, yeah. I, I, you know what? Here's my thought. I think about, I think about. uh, I guess it depends. Okay, I think there's a couple things I can think. I can think that for myself, 
it's a lot easier for me personally to lose fat than it is to gain muscle. If I lose muscle, it takes me a while to get it back. At the same time, I think of, remember when um, Victor Martinez got held by an ice detention camp or facility, or, you know, something like that? Mm -hmm. And his thought was, he was like, what I want to do is stay lean and I'll lose muscle because I know I can always gain the muscle back. So in his case, a guy like Juan, or a guy like Victor Martinez, he could probably regain muscle quickly. He's got those genetics. They, you know, he's had a lot of muscle. If he downsized by twenty five pounds or something in a several month period, I think that you know he could hop back on cycle and get that back in no time. Um, I would say if you're like Victor Martinez, my thought would be to stay lean because his thought was he didn't want to have to fight all that fat after he got out. So he tried to just dial his his nutrition back. I think for me, if I get a little bit chubby and then once I get back to things, that fat comes off me really quick. But in order mm -hmm. for me to put five, even, you know, even five pounds of muscle back on, it seems like it's always been an uphill battle for me of, of eating a lot of food. Um, what do you think of those things? Those, those ideas, Scott? That was pretty much what I had kind of outlined here is it depends really? on you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, if we're, well, the first thing is that I don't think he's going to be off any more than four weeks after a gyno surgery. Okay. Yeah. I mean, he's still thinking like eight weeks. Um, so I wouldn't be totally con terribly concerned to be honest, but yeah, if, if, if fat is his issue or if muscles issue, just, you know, diet accordingly, you know, or don't diet, you know, try to hold the size and don't worry about the body fat. He can obviously do a lot of cardio. I think, I think he doesn't want to be like jumping on a trampoline or anything like that. But or jogging or anything like that, but he could do a recumbent bike. Mm. Stay, he could stay really active. Yeah, um, during a good part of that, um, and he may be able to do some leg training. I don't know what it depends on what the requirements are. The the recommendations would be for his um, that his surgeon gives him. Yeah, um, I would also like like try to train like a motherfucker, like right up to the surgery. Yeah, he's already had the thing. I mean, he's already done so. He asked this question. I don't know how long ago because we're kind of, kind of uh, lacking here on getting to these very, very quickly. But it was over and done with. But I would like train like really hard. Yeah. So like that first like week or so is like basically a deload that he needed anyhow. <laughs> okay. Yeah. You know? Yeah. 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 Um, so he wouldn't. He wouldn't mind taking the time off. Hmm. And like I, yeah, I, I like like I, John Meadows and I have done that a few times when we when we gone to done things together like when I've gone out to California or the Arnold or what have you and it's like if you're going somewhere you have a period of time where you're not where training just isn't going to work it'll be just like a pain in the ass mm -hmm. like put like we would just do like three or four I would just like train three days in a row like really fucking hard yeah it's like okay so I don't I don't want to do I'm just recovering like for the next four or five days no training is perfectly appropriate right so he could do that literally he could get you know if there's he could basically overreach right up until that um, surgery and do it that way hmm. so but yeah like don't i wouldn't neglect the fact that he can do a lot of cardio and stay active that makes know? sense that's a good yeah, that's yeah. a good plan plus it's going to keep his appetite up too and keep kind of keep his head in the game i feel like if i'm not in yeah. the gym then my head's not in the game the same as if i'm going consistently still yeah on the other hand um this could be time to do some fun shit yeah you could probably do both you know? right i mean He's not going to be able to train like he was for a little while, at least, at least for a few weeks, couple weeks, maybe. Yeah, I mean, it depends on the person. Some people, I had, um, had someone ask on my board a few weeks ago. God, it was so, it was kind of unusual. Like, he wanted to know. He had just, he was like, he asked a bunch of questions. He was really highly motivated to make gains and all these sorts of things. And then I can't remember exact details. But then he got to the question. So, oh, by the way, I'm going on a family vacation for a month. And he actually was going to Disneyland. Okay. For like a month, I think. Or like, wow. Yeah, I was like, that's the best I could figure. And I think he was a firefighter. I can't remember. But and he said, you know, it's going to be a family vacation for four weeks, and he's not going to train. Huh. And I, like that was like he wasn't like he was he wasn't going to Belize. He wasn't going like to Antarctica. Yeah. He, and he was going for like four weeks, and like he, like he was to be totally preoccupied with his family. Didn't make any sense that he couldn't break away for forty five minutes three times a week to get in a quick workout. But right. Um, but in his case, he was just like just totally doing other stuff. 
Hmm. So he could like think, okay, what else? What, what do I have to do? Like, the, oh, what's the shit around the house I haven't done? Or hmm. well, like, what's another project I want to do? Or is this just these books I wanted to read? Or we we all have something that we've been putting off, probably, or something that would be edifying that we can that you could do in place of that. Yeah. A lot of times you hear people they're like they break away because we get in these patterns of life. You know that ba- a lot of times are not really they're they're not pushing us in the direction of personal growth mm. and evolution as an individual, they're reifying the pattern that keeps us out of looking deeper at whatever is going on with us or, or, or doing things that we think we should be doing. We want to be doing, and we just, we just keep putting them off by sticking in our, staying in our day to day pattern. Yeah. Maybe there's something in your life. This kind of goes for everybody. Like it's like, you know what? I need to read that book or I need to, I need to take this trip. Yeah. Or I need the I need to go do whatever it may be that I haven't done, you know, that needs to happen. And, and I've heard you, you probably I've heard of lots of people that have gotten when people get injured or when they have a timeout, like basically a forced layoff. It can be absolutely life changing. I could see that. Sure. I, I mean, I I know many examples of that happening to people because you just there's no time to, to stop and reflect on the important parts of your life. I mean, I know I've done this. I've taken training and I use it as a covering strategy to cover up shit that I don't mm. want to have to face. Yeah, yeah. You know, so this could be like, you know what? This is an opportunity. Not that this guy has like any, you know, deep seated psychological issues he needs to get at, but a lot of times it gives you a chance to do something with your life that's that's bigger and better and maybe maybe more balancing than than training. So I would look to that for someone in this situation. Say, okay, what else? Like, if I had a month to live, one month. So he's got four weeks. What would I do with that month? Yeah. You know, like how much progress can you make as a bodybuilder in a month? Like you're not going to go in the Mr. Olympia or whatever in a month, but there might be like, you know, a trip to see, you know, your grandmother that, you know, you you haven't seen and she's on her last leg or maybe you go spend two weeks with her taking care of her in a way that, you know, you would have, that you really think you should, you know, and now you have the opportunity. Instead of going to work out, you spend those, those times visiting with your grandmother. Yeah. Whatever, I, I think that'll keep you long term from from um, from developing any kind of resentments to bodybuilding either. Because if you if you never take care of those other things in life, then eventually I've known people that look back and they're like, "Geez, I just all I did was diet. I didn't ever mm-hmm. take a vacation. You know, I didn't ever do this. All these things." And then you know they started when they were in high school, and now they're thirty five years old. And they're like, geez, I haven't lived because all I did was was eat chicken, you know. And <laughs> right. then and then they you hate know? the sport, you know. Yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah, yeah. It's, this gives you a chance to step back and look, and le- at least get a sample of like what what you're missing. Yeah. Like really go sample. It's like it's actually can be a, a quite a blessing in disguise hmm. to say, are you now you can't train. You have to yeah, find some time to <laughs> something to do to fill that time. What is the best oper- What's the best thing you could do? The most gratifying, rewarding, um, meaningful thing that you can do with that time if it were the last four weeks you had on this world. Hell, I have people that tell me they, they can't take a day off of the gym. I mean, oh, yeah. They, they're like, oh, I train seven days. And I've kind of said so- similar things to them, like, well, just try training six for now on and see how that goes. And they say, well, I don't know what I would do with myself. And it's like, well, find mm-hmm. something, something, like you're saying, Scott, that's something else and fill yeah. your, that one day with this thing. And then maybe from there you might get an inkling of like, Oh yeah, there is a world outside of this, you know? Yeah. I mean, I don't want to, I would never want to impose my value system on someone else. You know, some people, you know, they're wired, you know, let's say that, um, you know, they just, for whatever reason, genetics or their, how they grew up, they're just kind of wired so that they literally, they have to be in this like incredibly almost OCD type of um, uh, predictable daily life. They have to know what's going to happen every next minute, yeah. you know, like, and they have to have the training to happen that day. And otherwise they feel just like, they feel like they're being torn apart if they step outside of that. So, so some people are like that. Like literally it's like, like too much of a stretch and there might be some, some folks, but the the one that the one that I that I question the most, the scenario like that is when, because I get this a lot, with, especially with fortitude training, is when people say to me, they they say, I know I would make better gains as a bodybuilder 
if I could get myself to just train four times or five times a week or whatever, but I have to train seven. Mm. Then it's like, so you're training to be the best bodybuilder that you are, and you know you're not doing it right because you have a compulsive need to do something that's not in your best interest. Yeah, yeah. That's like that's like that's an addiction. Yeah, it's like yeah. Alcohol fucks me up, and I can't stand it. I still have to drink it. Yeah. Heroin is ruining my life, but I can't stand it. I still have to shoot it. Yeah. Or whatever. Body weight training. I'm not. I'm. I'm doing way too much to be the best bodybuilder I can, but I can't stop myself. That then I was like, okay, now you. Now I'd love to help you. Let's figure out a way around it. But some people, I don't. You know, I don't know. Like you would just like there would be have to be so much internal evolution and work to be done that just can't be done online. Yeah, I try, I've learned this the hard way with a few people. Is that you just keep on trying and go on for years. Like try to lend them all the wisdom you can, and then like you know, unless someone's like literally in your life, you really can't make that big of an Im- impact from what I've seen. I can't say it can't be done, but yeah, it's very hard. I could see too how you come up against that a lot with fortitude training because it is a plan that you know it, 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 there's a good chance you're going to be cutting your your days of training back, right? There was a there was a guy. This was great. It was like I was like, wow, that's fucking honesty. There was a guy. He just I just responded to him this morning. He posted a thread and he just started fortitude training. <coughs> and he's uh, the name of his, the title of his thread was. I'm a dick, and I just had my first experience with erectile dysfunction. He just called it ED. Okay. And what he did, I could go and read it, but uh, the short and sweet of it is that he decided, to, and even though he knew better, I think I even maybe told him this, and I've said it a million times, he started with uh, Tier 3 Turbo, the okay. highest volume tier, the highest frequency, and then he started, and then he added to it because he's like, and he literally is making fun of himself in the thread. He had great perspective. He's like, so I thought I could add more, and I started adding more, added more, added more, and he just trained himself into a fucking hole. I bet, yeah. And then he was out on a date or something like that, and had he couldn't get it up because he was so fucking. It was just like he destroyed, he destroyed himself. Oh man. Yeah, but but he came back and he he posted on the board. <laughs> Which was great, you know, because it's anonymous. I don't. I mean, I could figure out where he is if I wanted to trace his IP, but I'm not going to do that. It doesn't matter. Sure, for sure. So, but he posted. It was a really nice, a really nice um, self disclosure mm-hmm. for people to see. It was, and it was. He made it humorous, but it was truthful. Yeah, is like he just thought he was just like just go 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 go, and he and he knew better, and he learned learned the hard way, or not the hard way. <laughs> pardon, the, pardon the pun. He learned the soft way. That that these have done that, you know. Yeah. Um, but he just couldn't hold himself back. So sometimes people have to kind of learn, and like that's the thing. If you if you have someone who's training seven days a week like that, and they just they keep on um, doing that, you know, you hate to have them learn. Take decades to learn. Like, oh shit, I wasted my life. But sometimes, like, that's the only way. That's a whole. We have to learn the hard way. We have to hit the bottom of our of our bucket. Sure. Most sure. of the time, to really learn. I mean, you know this from, you know, from your past, you know, your past drug use. You know, like, like a, a logical mind would have just said, "That's not a good thing for to do." I think I'll stop doing that. Right. Right. But how many fucking years did it take for you to get there? Like a lot. It took a long time. Absolutely. <laughs> right. So sometimes people just have to travel their path. You could like tell them, you know, give them reams and reams of your wisdom. Yeah. Um, but hopefully, you know, it creates a little bit of a paper trail that will, will resonate at some point in time. It's like, you know what? McNally told me that and Stevenson told me that. And, like, I've heard about I've heard about like 15 people that, whose opinions I respect tell me that. And it matches with my own experience. I think I'm going to stop now rather than do this for the next mm, five years. Yeah. So it does matter, I think. So you're, you're adding, but it's literally they're drops in the bucket a lot of times. They're not usually the... You know the flood that's going to break the dam, and people are going to go, "Oh, hallelujah! I should stop training yeah. seven times a week." Right. So you're planting the seeds, is what you're saying. Yeah, planting the seeds. All right, that's I'm. Gonna, sure. I'll move on here. We get to our second question, and this is from Thirty Eight Special. He says, uh, and once again, guys, this is over at the forum, forum.advicesradio.com. In the bodybuilding section, there's threads stickied at the top of uh, for each show, and this is at the Muscle Minds thread. He says. Uh, Scott Stevenson, looking back at the philosophies regarding DC style training and eating, which ones do you differ or disagree with? And did Ken answer this question? 
He did. Oh, he he answered this a, this is a little while back that we that we talked yeah. about it. I can't remember what he had said specifically. Mm. Um, but I know he doesn't really do a DC training himself, I believe. He, he did a, a little bit yeah. for a few blasts. I can't remember. It was a while ago. I just wondered what he had said. Um, first of all, if you do DC training, do it the way it's – like anything that Dante says is DC training. So there's a million ways you can do it, <laughs> and he would customize it it for somebody but do the two-way split start off with the two-way split as it's written on a tense muscle if you need to go to the three-way split if you're an older guy use the other split like the five-way split that he's come up with but do it the way he's written it out so you can compare notes with with thousands of people who've got logs who've done it that way that's a that's a tremendous resource upon which you can draw if you've done it the way those folks have done it hmm. it's kind of like you're trying to learn a language yeah you know, instead of like trying to make your own language, learn the language so that you can get grammatical and pronunciation corrections to people who speak the language. Right. Otherwise, you're speaking, you know, your own language that no one else speaks, and no one so no one's going to really tell you how to speak it because you're doing your own thing. Doesn't make sense. So, DC is awesome. I did it for like friggin' like seven years and like that, pretty much, kind of to the letter. First time um, I saw you, you were doing DC training with Dave Henry on Dave Henry's video. Yeah. Yeah, I introduced Dave to, to actually to DC training and to Dante. Yeah, yeah, way back when. So that's the first time I ever saw you with your long hair at the time, just like on the yeah. book. Yeah, yeah. So, so do it that way. It's a great program, just as it is written. It's yeah. like I don't, I don't differ or disagree with any of it. Actually, like it's all fucking awesome. Like there's, but there are other ways to do it. Like okay. there's more than one way to skin a cat. It's kind of like saying. It's like saying, like, like, what do you disagree with about a, you know, a Ferrari? Hmm. Nothing. It's a great fucking car. Like, like, yeah. But it's a Ferrari. It's like it may not be the car for you, but it's a Ferrari and it's great. Yeah. So it depends on the person. So I, I did some, I did some things that, for me, and I, this is all sort of trying to trip me out there with the glasses yeah. thing. They, they, they looked a little bent to me. So I was trying I know. to, I was trying to adjust bend mine. I think um, <laughs> these glasses are like 20 years old, actually. Really? Really? Yeah. Yeah. At least I'm serious. Um, so I added some things, um, or I changed some things based on what my experiences had been, um, as I was training and undergoing some injuries and trying different programs and various other things. Yeah. Um, looking at literature, and this is all kind of outlined. Titan training um, was one of the ones that I added in, um, or I did, and I learned a shitload from that. Okay. And that's all in the book, in my Forge Training book. So one of the things is that there's variation in recovery among individuals. And so once one program won't fit all, I put in three volume tiers in mine in Fortitude training um, compared to DC training. So the DC training has, he's, he's got different splits. There's a two way and a three way, and there's this five way that's more indifferent. And Dante would adjust those things given a, a, a person. And there's some adjustment points. A lot of people stop doing like two heavy sets for, for quads or for thighs. So instead of doing two heavy sets of squats and then a widow maker, they just do one. Hmm. Um, I think that was sort of mainly kind of a pussy maneuver. Some people can really dig in and make that happen. And then more people started doing it, and then people thought that was the way you're supposed to do it. But the original was two heavy sets. Okay. Huh. Most people couldn't push hard. Yeah. Was, people didn't. Well, people don't know that. But if you if you look back, that's originally kind of how he put it together. Okay. And Dante went through the same kind of process that I did too, which you know was predates. It's I think it's in the cycles for pennies thread that was on the Animal Kits board, that's out there you know um, archived all over the place where he, he messed around with the rest pause sets with more than three failure points, for instance. Hmm. He messed around with local people that he was training in the San Diego area for, for a few years okay. before he came up with the two-way split that eventually became the quote-unquote two-way do dog crap training split. And that was sort of like his like middle-of-the-bell curve type of program that fits most people. Hmm. Um, and, but then the three-way split came for more advanced people. Um, and then you would add widow makers hmm. to bring up weak body parts. So as opposed to just doing like a widow maker for quads or thighs, like a squat widow maker, a leg press or what have you, he would have people do those for muscle groups. 
particular hmm. on the three-way split only for the most part. So you might do like a maximum of like, I think I never, when I was, I was the official DC trainer um, for a few years. He sent everyone to me. I was like kind of the official go-to guy. Nice. Um, and now I guess he's sort of, fans, he trusts Dusty Hanshaw. Okay. That. I don't know if he's still got an officially stamped person, but I think Dusty's his guy. So I'll mention this the other day. <clears throat> is you would do maybe three of those over the three-way splits. So it would be basically the push-pull legs. And you might do like, a knee extension widowmaker on one day, and then you might do uh, like a back pull down widowmaker on another day, and then like a chest widowmaker. And maybe if you're like a really good recovery, you could add you could maybe add a triceps one in, <clears throat> and then a biceps one, and then maybe a calf one or something like that. Yeah. Right. No more than probably five total. So there's some variability in DC training, and that would be those would be volume adjustment points. What I did with fortitude training is I just had three different volume tiers basically. Um, so the volume tier that you choose would vary depending on how you auto-regulate things. So it could vary over the course of literally days or week by week or a blast by blast um, depending on the person. So recovery is all over the place. Some people train so freaking hard, volume tier one is what they do. It's the lowest volume. And some people can handle volume tier three. Hmm. And that's a combination of how hard you train versus how well you recover. If you can't train very hard, then you can handle higher volume. Yeah. But if you can't recover very well, you can't handle higher, higher, higher volume. Yeah. So there's a lot of things that go into that, like whether you're dieting, whether you're not dieting. Um, you know, there's also potentially the effect of whether you're assisted or you're on PEDs or not, or where you are with that. Like if someone's been training a certain way and also then they get enhanced, that can adjust things a little bit for a period of time. Sure. So anyway, there's a lot, a lot there. Um, I also uh, did a couple of the things that I think made more sense. I, I used more of a daily undulating periodization type of approach. So Dante had like heavy, the heavy sets, rest pause sets, and he had widow makers. Mm -hmm. And I've got kind of parallel to that. And I'm, I give him credit for all of this. I've got um, what I call loading sets. I've got muscle rounds and I've got pump sets. The things that's different that I've tried to do with fortitude training is to – Put the shift the focus on to muscle loading and away from um, making inroads into the central nervous system, which then would impact your endocrine system, your immune system, your autonomic nervous system. So when you do like a widow maker, where you're basically – you make it look like from the exterior that you're trying to kill yourself. Like just you're on a suicide mission. Yeah. And you want your wife to be grieving next mm -hmm. to your grave, you know, the next day or whatever. Yeah. That's widow maker. Like you made her wife into a widow. You don't want that in real life. But that's the idea of the set is that it's just a death set. It's a right. crazy – of a death wish. That destroys your nervous system. Hmm. Just tears you up. And what you got to before, I told you we come back to it. got to this question. When I have people do continuous repetitions during the course of their set, mm. that's so that you don't have that start and stop, and you don't get to those last, that last like near the end of the set rep or two where it's a maximal effort, and then repeat that again and again and oh, again. Oh, yeah. Those are the ones that it's like literally you may have maybe notice this. You're going you're going through a workout, and either you have like a really fucking good set that you take to like excruciating failure mm -hmm. or you're, maybe you just get to like maybe you're going to do four sets and you fail in the third one. Then your fourth set is for shit. Mm. Something about that failure point, it may be impacting the muscle in and of itself. There may be some damage that goes on. So the, the contractile material is damaged so you can't produce as much force and that's why your performance goes down. Mm -hmm. I think a lot of it has to do with your nervous system. It takes a whack from a true failure point. So sense. I try to minimize those failure points in the loading sets. There's only one of them in a muscle round, and there's only one of them on a, um, a pump set. Hmm. So the repetitions are continuous. You're not like going up to the edge of failure and stopping, going to the edge of failure and stopping, going to the edge of failure and stopping, and staying in that sort of danger zone where you're accruing neurological fatigue and neural fatigue. You go rep, 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 and if you're going to go to failure in that part of the – muscle round or if it's if it's the last of your loading sets or if it's an isolation exercise you can do it too um or it's the end of your pump set then you go to failure but just once hmm. you minimize that so you so you can accrue more volume of training with minimizing those failure points because the muscle can handle a shit more than the nervous system can yeah 
muscles can handle. And I, there's a whole spiel that I've gone into probably several times now on the, on this podcast of how that is hmm. talked about it many times. So, so those are the things that that's a, like an overarching theme with DC training that differentiates DC training from fortitude training is that I try to shift as much of the focus on to the muscle, um, uh, muscle loading and away from those neurological failure points. I love to train that way, but I did that by keeping the reps continuous and setting up the muscle rounds different from a rest pause set in DC training. Hmm. Only one failure point as opposed to three and the last, only the last of the loading sets in the comp exercise are failure points. Okay. You look like you're falling asleep on me, brother. No, I'm listening to you. I'm I'm thinking about I'm I'm thinking about what you're saying and thinking about uh how I'm uh, how I try to apply this to my own training. Um. Yeah, I it, it's some of it. I'm, I'm I'm just processing right now. Yeah. 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 Well, I mean, a lot of people do that. You don't. You see guys who do high volume. They don't take their sets to failure. Yeah. Yeah. They just don't because you couldn't. You can't train hard and long. You have to choose one. So if you're going to do 20 sets, you can't do all of them, 20 of them to failure. Right. It's just come, coming back to do that. So those guys, you'll see, you can look at the volume, the velocity of the bar, and actually the research has now borne this out pretty conclusively, that bar velocity um, tells you how close to failure someone is. The what? So what do you bar mean, what velocity. Do you, yeah. What do you mean by speed, that? The speed of the bar. Okay. So if I'm doing a set and I go like this, mm-hmm. oh, I'm done. I failed. No, you didn't. Like there was mm. like the bar was moving at the same speed. If I go like this, and then you slow down, then it's obvious then that you're failing. <laughs> I got zero velocity. Now you failed. Yeah. If I, it's true failure, the bar has to literally reach zero. Hmm. Do you find that yeah. the longer you've trained, the longer you can keep a consistent velocity, um, b- but until you reach failure. Um, with more training, your muscle endurance, uh, no, no, I'm just wondering. No. Um, I mean, you could, if you wanted to, if you so chose to do that, Yeah, you could do that. If you're, if your focus were external mm. on, on bar velocity, you could do that. Okay. Yeah. But. With with longer training, with greater training, just in general, yeah, um, your muscle endurance gets better. Mm. So your bar velocity, you can eke out more of those reps that look really, really hard. Mm. Okay, that makes so sense. So someone who's not in very good shape, they just peter out and they just fucking die. Okay. So they got the the sets chugging along. Yeah. And the velocity is look, looking good, and all of a sudden they just they Cut just it. crash. Yeah. Yeah, and that, and some of that's because they don't know how to push. Mm. They don't like the pain. Yeah, and they get inhibited, and they just like they stop because it hurts. And some of it's because they haven't developed muscle muscular endurance. Hmm. Um, so the muscle literally just doesn't have the endurance to continue. Hmm. Um, and plus, you don't start off your sets like blasting into them. Like you start off, and I mean, you, you kind of asked an artificial question because you're not getting a true. Um, be like, you know, one would start like their set and go, well, some people do, but just go as fast as they can. Right. But because if you've got a good mind muscle connection, as I said before, you're not going to, you're not going to go that fast. Yeah. You're going to be controlled in the weight. So you'll have lots of controlled reps at the same bar velocity, hmm. um, which a good advanced trainee will have. And right. then as they get to the end, the bar velocity will slowly, gradually go down. Hmm. Because they're able to push through the pain and they've got good muscle endurance. Yeah. So it was just a thought. Your question. Yeah, just a thought. Yeah. Yeah. Well, this is good so, stuff, man. Um, yeah, it just you, you just got me thinking. I don't I don't have anything else to say about it though. All right. Yeah, that's those are my answers to that question. I think that's the but the thing is DC people rotate between DC training and mountain dog training. They what? And fortitude, they rotate among DC training and mountain dog training and fortitude training. And a lot of people have really good results with that. Those three, yeah, uh, yeah. I mentioned that in the book too. That those are the, those are the three that I know fairly well because I co-wrote John's book, Brutality of Mountain Dog Training. And obviously, I know DC training pretty well. And then I, I heard of this Fortitude training thing. I heard it's good. I just you know I think it's a good idea. So those three are three that a lot of people have have done. 
And they all are different in various ways. DC training's more like just fucking go for it. Hmm. You're hitting failure points. You're just like, you know, just rocketing right into the sets. John has a different approach. He's at accruing volume and working your way up. It's a much higher volume program. But he's got the higher frequency versions now. Mm. Lots of variations there. It's like new and different. Like depending on which of his programs you you pick, it's, he's got all sorts of cool intensification techniques, badass programs. And then fortitude training is highly flexible. You pick your exercises for the muscle rounds, and it's it's got its own you know twists and turns. So they're all very. They, it's funny enough they all have a lot of the basic fundamental principles hmm. are built into all the programs hmm. and they on on the on the super on the surface you would think oh my god they, these are totally different but they're not at all hmm. yeah I they're can, not all they all have the basic basic commonalities i could see that the longer that i've looked at it i found i found the mountain dog stuff has worked really good for me just because i feel like i've gotten hurt a lot and it allows me to get some i've been able to warm up and push harder but i think that i've I've been graduating to, you know what, I haven't looked at as new programs, um, but I think I've been graduating to more lower frequency than than what I used to do that, that worked really well for me with the Mountain Dog stuff earlier on. You've been graduating to lower frequency? Um, I'm sorry, lower volume. Oh, okay, yeah, and higher low, frequency. Yeah, yeah, lower volume, okay. higher frequency. All right, yeah, yeah, that's what I thought you meant. The back stuff's really working, by the way, man. I'm really happy with it. So I'm waiting for the Instagram pick. I'm just Born after. Give me a little time. I'm working on the glute uh, transformation. That's coming. We're doing so. We have a contest at Bodybuilding Nerds Radio, oh, and yeah? uh, it's a transformation contest. So I committed to my glute transformation uh, is going to be July 4th is when it's due. So I'm coming up on it. I've got about a month now. Is, yeah, and when when is the pre picture from? The pre picture is from like right before the Arnold, somewhere in there. So what is that like? I don't even remember when the Arnold was. March. Right February. Yeah. Okay, beginning of so, March. And yeah. So yeah, March, there. April, May, June. Yeah, something so, like that. Four months. Yeah, four months. And I had been training a little bit longer than that, but it wasn't until it wasn't until I got a couple months in that I could feel like I really get the connection now. So Are, is it a thong pick? Or <laughs> no, no. A posing suit pick or what? Just, just or, like, uh, just like the boxer briefs side profile, and I'm and I'm gonna okay. try to mimic the first picture that I took. So, so that I can, were in boxers. Yeah, yeah. So I'm just gonna try to get the same angle because that's the hard thing, man. It's funny how angle changes so much, you know. Uh, oh yeah. Just the just the way you shoot it, how close it is. It's 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 hard to tell, but I can already see some improvements. They're, they're, it's coming along. So well, I hope you got a month, so you're three you're three quarters <laughs> of the way through. Right, right. Yeah. So it's coming along, man. Uh, All right, brother. Are you training today? No, nope, today is an off day. Me today as is, well. We avoided electrical inspection so far, so I, it's probably not happening. But I'm glad they didn't show up. So I, yeah, I'm going to just work around the house. Nice. Well, for everybody who's watched the show live, we appreciate it. And uh, once again, this is all coming out on Thursday. It'll be out on YouTube for the video. It'll be out at advicesradio.com and iTunes, as well as other podcast apps on audio. Dr. Scott, thanks for being with us. Much appreciated as always. Yep. Thank you, sir, for recording and editing and doing all the high-tech shit you do of, of course and we'll be back with another installment of the swole trinity so stay tuned for that later this yeah. week all right yep. guys for another episode of muscle minds with dr scott stevenson i'm scott mcnally we'll see you soon adios